Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Nahid Siamdust, who is at Yale as the inaugural Esan Yarshadow Fellow in Iranian Studies at the Macmillan Center. She is a cultural historian whose work concentrates primarily on the intersection between politics and various modes of cultural production and media forms in Iran and the wider Middle East, with a focus on questions of cultural mediation, political power, and social movements. Today we'll talk with Professor Siam Dust about her book, Soundtrack of the Revolution, The Politics of Music in Iran. Welcome, Professor Sanders. Thank you very much for having me. So this is very exciting. I'm very um, curious to hear about the music scene in Iran. So let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. My book is an alternative history of post-revolutionary Iran. There was a revolution in Iran in 1979. The royalist Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shah, was deposed in a very popular uprising. And in his place became an Islamic Republic with um, the revolutionary leader Ayatollah Ruhollah um, Khomeini. And so what my book does is really tell the story of the evolution of the state since then, considering this was a very radical break for Iranian politics and history, through the use of music, whether it's the state trying to regulate and administer music within society, mm -hmm. or um, the use by the people of music in order to relay all kinds of messages, cultural, political, social. There was a very stark uh, break for music at the time of the revolution, because once Khomeini took over, he was an aging cleric, he actually declared music banned. He said music is like opium for the masses. If you want your youth to be righteous, eliminate music completely. So his message was very clear and um, still music has very deep roots in Iranian society and mm -hmm. culture and within uh, really months the kind of music that Khomeini was speaking about entered even uh, state airwaves. And um, so I start the story of uh, music's role within society a few years before the revolution um, into the ban mm -hmm. and how from that point onward music really re-entered re society in a big way and uh, what kinds of functions it played within, mm -hmm. within Iranian society. Okay, I'm curious to know what led you to write the book. I was only nine when we uh, left Iran at the height of at one of the worst phases of the Iran-Iraq War in 1986. And um, I only went back about 10 years later as a teenager. And I remember being shocked by what I saw. Because when I left in 1986, this is seven, um, seven years into the revolution, music was a very sensitive um, s subject. And even as a child, I could tell, because on the way on to holidays at the Caspian Sea, for example, the grown-ups would try to hide musical tapes. There were checkpoints. You were not allowed to have certain kinds of tapes. Even though music had been green-lighted, certain kinds of it only was. So march music, religious music, a bit more rhythmical, but only if it was committed to the ideals of the revolution. So mm -hmm. any music that was, you know, pop music from, um, from uh, prior to the revolution, from the Shah's era, any rock music, any Western music, all of that was not um, allowed. Mm -hmm. And so at these checkpoints, soldiers would actually check the cars to see if there were any musical tapes, any banned musical tapes. And there were fairly severe punishments for possessing such tapes. So mm -hmm. anywhere from fines to lashings to you know imprisonment for, for a few days and so on. And um, still, music played such a huge role in my life as a child in Iran because Iranians love to uh, be together. They love to celebrate. Music plays a huge role. There, you know, in any party with a f even a few Iranians, if there's a certain kind of rhythm, which is the six-eighth rhythm, with which culturally sort of dance-inducing to Iranians, if you start a song, everybody will get up and dance. So, mm -hmm. still, music played also such a huge role in the private spaces of my childhood. So there was this dilemma where the state was trying to control the use of music and where Iranians consume it. Um, hugely within their private mm -hmm. spaces. When I returned as a teenager, I realized that there, 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 a huge change had happened, actually, from the time when I was a child, when I'd been a child back in Iran. My parents took me to a restaurant at um, in one of these uh, uh, grand hotels, which bef before the revolution was called Hyatt, and now was called Azadi Freedom. So mm -hmm. all these American <laughs> and Western hotels had been taken over by the Iranian government. And at the swimming pool, there was a grand piano, and there was a pianist who was actually sitting there and playing the piano. Uh, when I was a child in Iran, music in public would have been unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And so immediately, I 
um, I sensed that something big had changed. And, but at the same time, he would play the music at the piano, but people knew not to clap. So clapping was still not OK, because the expression of joy in public was still problematic. My goodness. Yeah, and so <laughs> I, I returned to Iran subsequently a few years later to work as a, after I um, graduated from college um, and got my master's, I returned to work as a journalist. And again, I saw huge changes. At that point in early 2000s, there were now huge pop concerts, sort of dance music almost, um, heavily attended, thousands of people. And revolutionary Iran, uh, which at the beginning of its tenure, had banned music now not only allowed some kind of music, it actually allowed pop music, which had been declared completely illegitimate at the time of the revolution mm -hmm. because of its associations with the promiscuous sort of scene that it represented prior to the revolution, where the gender is mixed, alcohol was consumed in the cabarets of a cosmopolitan Tehran in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So I traced this evolution and tried to understand how it came about that um, certain kinds of music eventually were allowed, and to the state now, where there are dozens of concerts every month in Iran, and the state um, you know, tries to balance its own interests versus trying to satisfy a very young, uh, outward-looking, uh, globalized population. I'm curious, uh, did you track the changes from 1979 to uh, a, a more recent time, and I'm, I am very interested to know how music kind of snuck back into society. So what happened was uh, a few months, first of all, music had played a huge role mm -hmm. in the revolution's success. There was a very organic production, uh, voluminous production of music leading to the revolution. All these revolutionary songs that are sort of ingrained in every person who went through that period. So it was huge for making the revolution actually succeed. When Khomeini banned music, he was a cleric who spent his days in contemplation and reading texts and so on. He didn't come from a background where he understood, I suppose, or uh, you know, had lived through contexts where music can be used in contexts other than cabarets. And for him, music really meant that scene, that you know, Shah era scene. Mm -hmm. Um, but then a, a year into the, a few months actually into the revolution, one of his uh, favorite protégés, Ayatollah uh, Mortaza Motahari, was assassinated. There, there, was, there are a lot of skirmishes sort of in the beginning years of the revolution, mm -hmm. as, as there are with most revolutions and people trying to grab, the different political factions trying to grab power, the leftists, the nationalists, the Islamists. So there was this huge assassination plot, and in it Ayatollah Mortazari, sorry, Ayatollah Motahari passed away. And um, some people in the uh, uh, state radio produced this song in his commemoration. And for, for, for the one year of his commemoration, they presented it to Khomeini himself. They said, you know, we've made this song. We know it's more rhythmical, more musical than what's currently there on state airwaves. We just want to show it to the imam himself and see what he thinks. So Khomeini listened to this song. And he said, uh, you know, I, I really would like to see the makers of this song. And the makers of this song were brought into his presence. And he told them, I don't cry much, but I cried when I heard your song. It's the most beautiful song I've ever heard. And if you continue to make music like this, I will support you. So from that point onward, there was this notion of a committed kind of music that, uh, that even if it was more rhythmical, even if it was more musical, and this particular piece actually contains rhythmical sort of uh, uh, passages that are very reminiscent of some pre-revolutionary pop era, mm -hmm. classical pop music. And, um, but from that point onward, it was understood that if the music was used in the service of the revolution and the ideals of the revolution, it would be, it would be OK. So that was sort of the first moment when uh, make sort of cultural uh, producers realize that there was a way forward with music. Mm -hmm. And from that point onward, um, there were a few other um, important uh, sort of landmark decisions okay. and moments that led to what we have today. Okay, and you, you look specifically at four musicians in your book. Tell us a little bit about their work and, you know, how they're how their work contributes, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, the culture of Iran. 
So I look at, um, my work is fairly chronological. <coughs> chronological. I look at the first sort of the first decade of the revolution through Iran's preeminent vocalist of Persian classical music, Mohammad Reza Shah Jaryan. I then move on to the second decade where young musicians graduating from the music academy, the first sort of class that graduated from the music academy in post-revolutionary Iran really was trying to make music and make, a, make careers out of music. Mm -hmm. So I look at state approved, um, at the state approved musician Ali Reza Assar and the whole process through which these, this Islamic Iran decided pop music is okay mm -hmm. because it was banned for two decades and then there was this watershed moment where they decided we're going to let it happen mm -hmm. and it was quite shocking to people who were part of this um, period in post-revolutionary Iran. Many people uh, believed that uh, another, <laughs> I mean some people thought a whole other revolution had happened because all of a sudden this pop music was there on the on state radios. And what radios. was the um, watershed moment? I mean what was the reason that they allowed it? So, um, do you want me to t sure. uh, continue with the other two musicians before I get back to this point? Or um, break it up here? Whatever you I'll prefer. break it up okay. here and then I go okay. back to the other two musicians uh, who I write about in detail. I write about dozens of musicians really in the book, but there are okay. four musicians whose work I really highlight. And okay. so Ali Reza Assar, so what happened that Islamic Republic decided, uh, the Islamic Republic decided to allow for pop music? For two, nearly two decades, Iranians had basically been listening to pop music coming from Los Angeles. So there was a huge music scene in Iran at the time of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the revolution happens, Khomeini bans music, clearly this is going to be a whole different kind of uh, government. And a, a huge population of music makers basically um, packs up and moves to LA, okay. to Los Angeles. And uh, which is why Los Angeles is often referred to as Tehrangelis by Iranians. Okay. Um, the largest community of Iranian expats outside of Iran resides in Los Angeles. And um, so they set up shop there and continue producing music. So for two decades, really, Iranians inside Iran listened to music coming from Los Angeles, very similar to music that was produced to uh, produce in pre-revolutionary mm -hmm. Iran in the Shah's time. But or, underground. Um, you know, in their homes, exactly. Right, so yes. these tapes would come in through cassette tapes, mm -hmm. VHS, eventually satellite TV technology, exactly. So it would be in private spaces and um, not in the public. And, um, but meanwhile, these young music uh, graduates were working on creating their own their own music that corresponded to their realities as young kids coming of age in the Islamic Republic. They wanted to make music uh, their career, not for ideological reasons, but really because that's what they like to do, music. For years, I talked to the guy, um, Hashar Etemadi, for years they tried um, to have the government approve their music. So mm -hmm. Hashar Etemadi, the guy who produced Iran's first post-revolutionary pop song, he told me um, that he went oh, for, for three, four years again and again and again to state radio and television officials and said, you know, put his, song, his music in front of them and said, you know, this is, this is something I've made. Can you listen to it? Can you, can you consider broadcasting it? And over and over again, they would say, um, no. Um, they would write him these notes in green ink and say, no, your voice, uh, there are many problems, including that his voice was actually quite similar to the, um, his voice was quite similar to the voice of one of Iran's most famous post, uh, pre-revolutionary pop singers, oh. Daryush. So Khashar Etemadi, this post-revolutionary guy in his early 20s who was producing this music, had a role model, and this role model happened to be a, a pre-revolutionary pop singer, but there's a very uncanny similarity between their voices. But ultimately what happened, and this kind of tells you that this process was not completely top-down, as many people, uh, Iranians, um, actually still believe probably. They think it's a conspiracy by the Islamic Republic to produce pop music to rival the pop music that was coming from abroad. That was mm -hmm. part of the reasoning later on. But really what happened was these young kids kept pushing, and finally there was an official at state uh, television who had the political capital in order to approve this music. He was a confidant of uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the current Supreme Leader, the Supreme Leader that took over after Ayatollah Khomeini. He was a confidant of his. He, he also happened to be a poet and an artist, so perhaps a softer heart. Mm -hmm. 
and he listened to the music and he said, you know, I don't, I don't see a problem with this music. I think we should broadcast it. And um, the, the story goes, the sort of behind the scenes story, which I couldn't confirm 100% because it's one of those, um, you know, sort of legends that you, that, you, uh, that you hear about that you can't really 100% confirm, goes that he spoke to Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah Khamenei um, sought the opinion of other clerics in Qom, the Iran seminary town. And uh, there were discussions that, look, if we don't produce our own kind of pop music, these kids will continue listening to pop music coming in from LA. Why not try to have our own uh, pop music industry here? So it was really a push from below from these young kids and ultimately approved. Mm -hmm. um, the story also highlights the importance of sort of personal agency of this one guy at state television who found, who felt like he had the capital to really take this on and push through with this. And so not long after that, this pop song was aired on state radio and Khashar Itamadi, the singer's, the young singer's own anecdote of this, um, of, of, of hearing his own song for the first time on state radio was that he was in a taxi cab and all of a sudden his song came on and the taxi driver just sort of, you know, put his foot on the brakes and came to a sort of screeching halt and he said, oh my God, things are about to change in a big way. Um, Daryush, you know, this pre-revolutionary singer is back and he's singing on state radio. Goodness. <laughs> and Khashar Itamadi uh, was sort of sitting in the back seat and he said, no, 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 that's me. That's, I'm, 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 I'm the one singing this song. And the driver apparently was just like, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe <laughs> him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, and then that from that point story. onward, from that point onward, um, they allowed for other pop songs to be st aired mm -hmm. on state radio and um, today really the Islamic Republic has resolved to allow for even very uh, rhythmically fast uh, pop songs with sometimes even risque topics you know of uh, singers singing about lovers who are not interested in real love which of course implicates that insinuates mm -hmm. that they're interested in you know physical love rather than right. um, that was a red line that the Islamic Republic officials crossed sort of about mm -hmm. a decade ago I would say uh, but the line now has been firmly drawn at political themes. So okay, I was going fast to ask is okay. You, yeah. you know, love themes, even risque ones, uh, are okay. But no criticism um, of the government. But no explicit criticism of the government. But that does not mean that musicians and audiences don't manage through music mm -hmm. to actually engage in political criticism. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, what about the other? So the other two musicians whose work I cover in detail. Mm -hmm. Are Mohsen Namju. He uh, is a musician who today lives in Brooklyn. His music was quite groundbreaking for the Iranian music scene because he dared to take Persian classical music, which was the sort of sacred art form that had, you know, uh, all, all kinds of considerations as to how you perform it, in which settings, the respectability of it, and so on. He took it and mixed it with blues and rock and jazz, and in a song that actually got him banned from the country even took verses from the Quran and used them as, as if they were any other kind of text. Mm -hmm. So they're you know, centuries long traditions of the recitation of the Quran and how one does it, um, in uh, what kind of person is, you know, has the, um, st the stature to recite the Quran, mm -hmm. it must be an Islamic person and so on. He took some texts from the Quran and uh, basically sang it with, um, alongside with rock and blues. And, that finally got him um, into uh, to receive a, s a prison uh, sentence of five years, and he happened to be outside of Iran at the time when this happened, and so has never returned. Right. Um, but his music, uh, because of the use of fusion of all different modes of music, and also his at the time very critical lyrics, uh, was quite groundbreaking for the Iranian mm -hmm. scene in the mid uh, sort of late two thousands. The fourth art is artist, who's a musician whose work I cover in detail, is uh, Surush Lashkari, also known as um, Hichkas, the godfather of Persian hip hop. He was instrumental in in uh, in getting a hip hop scene going in Iran, and he's one of the most popular rappers in Iran. Although there there have there has now been a whole new generation after him, mm -hmm. uh, but his his music is uh, is. Um, his whole mode of his discourse is very different from Nam Jews, the the alternative in what uh, sort way? of fusion. So Mohsen Nam Jew uh, is now in his early forties. He came about. He came of age at a time when 
there, there are still very strict restrictions on people's private, uh, public and also private lives. Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, you couldn't, uh, for example, have long hair as a man or wear short sleeves. Or this is, you know, in the first two decades of the revolution, it was still a very um, severe sort of public um, policing of people's lives and bodies. Mm -hmm. And so his his music and his uh, the kinds of things that he sings about are very um, he's basically in a in a conversation with that upbringing and the state and um, rebelling against that and the kinds of strictures that were put on him. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock comes of age a couple of um, about a decade later. He does not remember the revolution or the eight year war with Iraq, which mm -hmm. was a very um, difficult moment for most Iranians. He came of age at a time when George W. Bush had taken over, 9-11 happened, Iran was declared part of the axis of evil, mm -hmm. and these young kids coming of age in Iran, really um, they, they had um, more of a um, you know, sort of uh, fight to pick with having been being subjugated to that kind of discourse where they are part of this uh, axis of evil and um, the unequal power uh, global power relations in the world where America gets to attack and invade Afghanistan and Iraq. And so it's, it's a whole different kind of discourse. He's not really in conversation with the state. He is rivaling the state, which is why uh, his music is, I think, so pertinent and so popular within um, among young Iranians because he presents this other kind of um, I mean, by by putting one of his songs, for example, is called A Bunch of Soldiers. And in it, he says, you know, the streets are the biggest universities, me and my posse, um, we are the soldiers of Iran, we hold up the flag. So implicitly, he's um, really passing this message that the Iranian state is no longer fit to hold up Iran's honor. It's, his discourse is based on this old Iranian honor code where Iranians have to stand up to protect their honor and to stand up for what they believe in because mm -hmm. the state is no longer capable of doing that. And once the 2009 Green Uprising happened, um, he produced a song uh, in which um, there's some implicit critique um, enough that he was questioned several times and ultimately decided to leave the country. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the future holds for the music scene in Iran? And how do you think the, mu the music will identify Iran in the, in the coming years? So I think uh, the, one of the most interesting musicians whose work I look at is the, vocal, the vocalist of um, Persian classical music, Mohammad Azhar Shah Jair. He's, he's an icon for Iranians. And he's been singing. He's now 70, 70 years old. He's been singing for many decades prior to the revolution, after the revolution. And um, through his music, you really see sort of the long arc of uh, Iranian politics. Mm -hmm. And there's that saying, you know, the long arc of the moral universe, uh, uh, the moral, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends toward justice. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can apply that to the Iranian um, scene and say the arc of Iranian politics is, is long and it bends toward democracy and freedom. Mm -hmm. And you really see that. And when we think about underground music or political music, in the Iranian context, we always think about rock music and rap music and so on. But I would argue that, and I do argue in the book, that his music is the most pertinent because it connects back to a time about a century ago when Iranians had an uprising and a revolution for a constitution in 1906. Mm -hmm. uh, take some of those songs that were composed back then and really in his, through his concerts and through his music is able to draw this long arc. and. Um, audiences engage with him in um, very passionate ways and call forth on him to sing this song, uh, The Morning Bird, in which the caged bird is called upon to break free from the mm -hmm. cage and sing of freedom and so on. And I think when you look at Iranian music, you see that. You see there's, there's uh, and not just in the you know rock and rap and whatever, you really see it in the more classical music even more so. Uh, that is deeply ingrained in Iranian um, families and of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You do see that there's um, this diverse message and uh, presented in different genres and modes and so on, but that ultimately the music that matters, the music that people um, really care about has this message of freedom and uh, greater rights. Mm -hmm. And um, the word democracy is a little tainted and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, the kinds of things that Iranian society aspire to. And I believe the music points to, uh, you know, some, something hopeful. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will ever get back to pre-1979, where they had basically full freedom to express themselves as um, they would like? So that is a, a misunderstanding. Uh, actually, prior to 1979, okay. you know, it was a different kind of, a, in fact, one must say that there's been much greater democracy in post-revolutionary Iran okay. than in pre-revolutionary Iran. Right. So prior to the revolution, it was a royal dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, there, was basic, there were basically no political parties. Uh, the political party that existed was the Shah's political party. Mm -hmm. um, but following the revolution, there have been actual elections. And so it's complicated because politically people have many more rights mm -hmm. uh, since the revolution. But, of course, it's an Islamic Republic with its own Islamic ideals. And so in terms of personal freedoms and um, also political freedoms, I'm not saying there's like full political freedom, mm -hmm. but compared to pri you know, prior to the revolution, there, there are right. certainly more political freedoms. Um, um, so I don't think most people would want it to go back to the time before no, no, the revolution. I'm just, just in terms of mm. the music itself, okay. was there more freedom in the music prior to 1979? No, people no. would have gotten into trouble okay. for stating political um, sort of opinions okay. back then too. Okay. Yeah. That's good to understand. Yeah. So what do you conclude in your book? So I conclude that music has been this incredible space where despite the given restrictions, uh, heroic musicians and their corresponding audiences have managed to carve out the space uh, to allow for conversations to happen that would not be happening in the, pub in the open public sphere, mm -hmm. uh, pushing on all kinds of topics. The internet, of course, has been super helpful as sure. well in allowing for this kind of music to circulate. Prior to the internet, uh, it had to happen in concerts and it was a bit more, uh, it was less explicit. But since the internet and people being able to access any kind of music, these messages can be relayed more openly and people mm -hmm. can consume them more easily. So music really offers this very significant political space that is quite understudied still. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the conclusions of the book. The other conclusion of the book is um, really about how the Islamic Republic has functioned as a state in terms of its um, policy uh, making in social and cultural areas. Mm -hmm. um, and there the conclusion is that the Islamic Republic has been uh, quite um, adept at trying to find uh, ways of uh, responding to some of the needs of the population, mm -hmm. uh, but very clear on the red lines and drawing them at, at, at its political mm -hmm. sort of um, uh, uh, sort of borders. Right, right. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much work. for having me. For more information about Professor Siam Dust and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.